Ladies and gentlemen, this is a rare occasion where we only have family. And as you all know, ISAS is simultaneously a think tank and a research institute. Today, the research side is going to have to dominate because that's what we have around the table. I'm delighted to have with us Professor Crispin Bates from Edinburgh. He will talk about Bihari Overseas Labor Migration, 1857 to 1869, Origins, intermediaries, and the role of trust. Now, a couple of words about Crispin, then a couple of words about his topic. I was appointed to Hull on a new blood post in 1985, and shortly thereafter, I went to Cambridge uh, for a workshop that I had organized, and that's where I had uh, our Crispin perform. He was, at the time, a subaltern historian. He has remained one, and he was performing, if I remember correctly, on uh, tribals from the Chhattisgarh area or mm -hmm. something on those lines. And uh, we uh, have kept up our links all through the many, many years. And most recently in Edinburgh, I was their external examiner. And uh, I also was asked to assess their institute. That's how I got to know a lot more about, uh, about them. But the point is, when you have known someone and uh, you uh, sort of grow um, separately, but uh, evolve. You don't pay attention to details, which is why today, when I had to read about him, I discovered, to my joy and not to my horror, that one of his books, Subalterns and Raj, um, not there, Raj, Subalterns and Raj, published by Rutledge in 2007, has sold over. 3,000 copies. Now, how can an academic work sell in such large numbers? <laughs> anyway, you have to explain this to us. <laughs> and now he has got a huge grant to work on Indian uprising of 1857. Now, the thing that happened in 1857 had two different names. The British call it the Sepoy Mutiny, and Indians call it the First War of Independence. Um, Crispin has found uh, the middle ground. So in Indian <laughs> uprising. He'll have to tell us more about it. And he's a professor of modern and contemporary South Asian history. So why is modern not contemporary? And why is contemporary not quite modern? Again, you have to explain to us. But all of it to say, why should ISAS, an institute whose mandate is to work on contemporary South Asia in the areas of trade and economy, foreign policy and governance, why should we here about, uh, about what? Bihari overseas labor migration. And that is what makes this graduate seminar for me exciting, because that is the contribution of subaltern historians. That is the contribution of, uh, that is the contribution of uh, the scholarship of Crispin to show that history is not necessarily behind you, that the imperial certainties which divided history into the ancient, medieval, <coughs> modern. Um, ancient, medieval, modern, and the imperial commitment to give independence to countries like India, many of those certainties now stand questioned. Many things that we thought were behind us, which we left behind in the course of modernization, like identity or ethnicity, are not quite behind but uh, with us, if not in front of us. So this is the approach that brings our three major areas together. Um, on another occasion, I said when Prof. Uh, Robin was here that everything has a history, so histri historians can do anything, uh, including turning garbage to Harvard, um, not Harvard to garbage. That was his last book. And then I said, but what would historians do if every discipline claimed its own back? Because the discipline, which is not quite a discipline, and which is very important to us, which is the South Asian diaspora, is something with which Crispin is closely connected. And the diaspora starts with the migration, and that's a long history, and that is also something that connects this population to Singapore. In short, we have with us a colleague who will talk to us about his own precise research, and then we'll all connect with him in terms of our own researchers to see how South Asia Institute itself is a hub 
of the larger world we are talking about and why history as a discipline can help us think in terms of time not as linear but non-linear, which is why we still talk about Ayodhya, uh, we even talk about the Caliphate and stuff like that. So you have the floor, normally our speakers go on for 40, 45 minutes, then I stop them to have a proper conversation. You have the floor. Right, thank you very much. Well, I, um, I, I teach contemporary history. I, my title is Professor of Modern and Contemporary History because um, a, a lot of um, historians think that um, history ends in 1945 or 1947 in the case of India. Um, and um, uh, I think the historical method is applicable to all eras. And indeed, I teach the history of South Asia, the whole of South Asia, right up to the present day, uh, using historical methodology. Um, uh, the research project that um, uh, uh, Professor Mitra referred to on 1857 um, has now ended. And I'm now engaged in another large research project with funding from the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council, which is one on Indian overseas migration. Um, and the two are intimately connected, the Great Indian Uprising of 1857 and Indian overseas migration, as I shall go on to explain in uh, this course. Of course, the relevance to us today is, is that studying migration can enable us to address all sorts of issues, which I shall touch upon in the talk, which are of high considerable relevance to development economics in the present day. Um, I think that the past can, has many lessons to teach us, but uh, not least of all, alternative ways of imagining the future, because very often you will find that what is the latest bright idea of the current generation has in indeed already been tried in the past. Um, the South Asian diaspora, um, primarily of Indians, um, but, uh, uh, but also of um, Sinhalese, Bangladeshis, uh, um, to a lesser extent Pakistanis, um, uh, to a substantial way, extent, built the Indian Ocean world. Um, uh, all the railways, uh, the cities, uh, the governor's residences, the docks uh, in uh, South Africa, in Mauritius, in Sri Lanka, in Myanmar, and in Malaysia and Singapore were all built by Indian migrant laborers, most of whom subsequently went home. So their importance is not so visible um, because they did not stay. They were merely sojourners. They, they, they were here for a few years and then went back. Um, and much of this history of colonial migration has been told about in terms of statistics, um, uh, tales of uh, gross exploitation as uh, illustrative of the evils of, uh, of imperialism, but very little has been written about the social life of these migrants. Um, and this is primarily what we are concerned with in this uh, project. Um, now, in the course of this research, I've been visiting archives all around the Indian Ocean, in, in South Africa, in Pietermaritzburg, in Mauritius, in Sri Lanka, in Colombo, in Assam, and in Myanmar, and also I've been on two trips to the archives uh, in, uh, of Malaysian National Archives in Kuala Lumpur. This is my first visit to Singapore, but it will be the first of many, I imagine, because the archives here I know have got some very interesting material which I definitely want to use. So uh, the project is called Becoming Coolies, and it's about the origins of Indian overseas labor migration in the period from 1788 to 1920. Um, and my idea is this is going to then segue into a, a subsequent project about, cosmo about South Asian cosmopolitanism in the period 1920 to 1965. Um, and the, the themes of this project are, I summarize as follows. First of all, one of the big arguments that we're making is, is that uh, the most notorious form of uh, Indian overseas migration was indentured labor migration. It's only actually accounted for probably perhaps uh, a third or a quarter, between a quarter and a third of the total migrants who are on indentured contracts. But this was a very small part of the total story of um, uh, Indian overseas migration. And one of the big arguments that we want to make is, in fact, this might migration has been going on for a lot longer uh, than, uh, than people imagine. One of the big uh, assumptions that's often made about this migration is that the migrants were entirely unskilled and uneducated. Uh, this was how basically the planters persuaded the government of India to go along with the scheme in the first place. Because the government of India was little known that the government of India was always opposed to Indian overseas migration. <laughs> 
Um, they wanted skilled workers to be kept back in India to develop the plantations and industries of India. Uh, colonialism is often spoken of as being a vast united conspiracy, but in fact, the colonies of the British Empire were bitter rivals for resources, and Indian uh, labor was one of the most important of those resources. So one of the ways that indentured labor migration was sold uh, to uh, the uh, government of India was by, by the planters arguing, well, don't worry, we'll just take the lowest of the low, the most backward and ingrown, uneducated, unemployed people. And that idea has stuck. It's enshrined in British parliamentary debates. But the reality, as I will go on to show you, is very different. Um, another thing that will be challenging is the idea that migrants were mostly men. It's true that in the case of um, Malaysia, perhaps only 25 of the total migrants were women. But in most of the overseas destinations, um, the numbers of men and women were roughly equal by the turn of the century. Most migrants were, in fact, traveling with their families um, and with the aim and ambition of becoming permanent settlers. The project also seeks to uh, challenge their kind of common dichotomous interpretations that all the migrants were, uh, were unwilling, uh, they were either duped or kidnapped, or the alternative, which has been put by um, a Dutch historian, Peter Emmer, that they were profit-maximizing individuals looking for advantage, the best advantages in the world labor market and where best to sell their labor. Uh, of course, the, both of these extremes are tropes which can be challenged on any number of grounds. Um, but I suppose the biggest want argument that we want, I want to get all across is the idea that South Asians have been global citizens longer than we imagine. Um, uh, ev uh, everyone um, uh, speaks very positively about European migration to the New World. Europeans who settled in the world, New World are somehow heroes, pioneers. Uh, they're not depicted as victims. Um, but for some reason or other, the idea has become very commonplace that all Indian overseas migrants in the colonial era were somehow tragic victims whose story you know, we, should be, we should only look upon with sadness and regret. And contemporary migrants in North America, when you, are, when you ask them about you know, where they come from and how they see themselves, they will often call themselves the second wave meaning that they are educated and middle class and not at all like those dirty, uneducated laboring peasants who migrated in the 19th century. And one of the arguments that we're trying to make is, in fact, the differences between contemporary migration and historical migration are not so different. The major industries were of the 19th century were plantations and factories, and, this is where, and also railway construction, and this is where most people had ended up working. If they had computers in the 1880s, they would have been IT wallers. Um, and they were certainly skilled enough to be so, is one of my arguments. Um, um, the most interesting part of this project, though, is the way that we're tr ex attempting to explore the way in networks um, uh, uh, and, uh, and a amongst the migrants were the primary determinants of where they went. Um, and this is fairly self-evident if you look at it closely. Um, uh, Ravindra, Ravindra Jain did a very good study of migration uh, to the rubber plantations in, in, in uh, Malaysia, uh, showing how different villages were connected in India, were connected with specific plantations um, in Malaysia. And this is a story which is told all over the world in terms of Indian migration, but not only Indian migration. It's a characteristic of all migration flows that they are uh, primarily involving uh, networks. And these networks, uh, determined the supply of labor more than the demands of the employers. Um, uh, it is often assumed that because so much is written about the way the colonial indenture system was managed that the British were really in charge. They weren't. They were widely subverted by the Indians than, who, who actually recruited themselves more often than not. And I'll be saying a little bit more about that later on. Um, one of the things I'm most keen to do is to show how not power relations, but affective relationships um, uh, and, uh, determined the lives of the migrants. More often than not, these affective, intimate, personal relationships were what determined their fate. And where they were successful, it enabled them to evade the dominant uh, structures of the colonial systems and even uh, to find ways to flourish, uh, often in very creative and unanticipated ways. And that is what I'm primarily looking for, instances of creativity and enterprise amongst these migrants. Um, and 
what I'm really keen to show is how within this overarching colonial system, uh, Indian migrants exercised their agency. They found ways uh, to cooperate, uh, to mitigate the circumstances of their employment. There's no denying the harshness of the conditions that many of them faced. Well, what is remarkable is how many of them within uh, two generations, or even within their own lifetimes, had become property owners, and within two generations subsequently had their, were, their offspring were, you know, graduates uh, occupying skilled professions. They're, they're, this is a, a story, above all, of upward, very rapid upward mobility. And how that came about, if they were such poor, helpless, ignorant people, is uh, one of the questions I seek to answer. Um, Overall, uh, one of the other things the project also will question is, I, is the idea, the cl question is the notion of freedom defined by the idea of the classical liberal atomistic sovereign subject seen in official historical and development discourse. And the reality is that none of these migrants survived, were recruited as individuals. None of them prospered as individuals, but in fact um, uh, were able to survive and to um, uh, take advantage of opportunities through their ability, with, due to their ability to collaborate with others. Um, and I would argue this is in fact the kind of characteristic of all labor systems. Um, although the British liked to treat into peoples and in individuals, try to prevent them from um, actually forming any kind of um, um, uh, syndicates or trade unions that might mitigate their conditions. In fact, Indians below the radar were very successful in doing this. Um, Okay, so what was indentured labour migration? As I've said, this is the this is the aspect of Indo overseas migration which is most notorious. Um, and I don't know how many of you have heard of indentured labour migration. Have any of you familiar with it? Um, okay, well, probably not many of you know that indentured migration, uh, sorry, indentured employment is alive and well in the present day. Uh, millions are employed on indentured contracts of indenture in all the world's armies because our soldiers always work on contracts of indenture um, uh, for five years, for seven years, even up to 25 years in the Pakistani army. Um, the, and in the, in the military contract, um, you can get out within the first year. You can buy your way out in the first year, but after that, you're, you're in until the end of term. The indentured contracts used in sugar plantations were actually first used to recruit Europeans to work in the sugar plantations of the Caribbean. They were also used indentured contracts in the Indian Army from the early 19th century onwards. Um, they were then developed after the abolition of slavery in 1833 to supply Indian labor to sugar colonies um, from the 1830s onwards. And it was a fixed five-year term contract, sometimes four, sometimes three. The maximum was five, shortest was three. Um, um, and what is little known is, is that people could actually buy their way out of this contract at any time if they saved hard enough or they had relatives willing and able to buy them out. And many did. I've seen the correspondence. I know how much it cost and how many did so. Um, the laborers were known as Giamitias or Coolies if they were Indians or Singhis if they were tried Try, uh, if they were Chinese. And when this system of indentured labor migration began in 1833, there were howls of protest from the anti-slavery lobby in London who thought this was just a new alternative to slavery. It was slavery continuing by other means. And it was suspended in 1838, and there was then a big debate in the Houses of Parliament, which I've already referred to, um, following which it was then resumed from 1843 under very close supervision. And is that close supervision, supervision which is why we have have so much detail on indentured migration. The other systems of Indian migration, which I'm equally interested in, are much harder to research. But indentured labor, labor migration was, in fact, the, the most highly documented industry in the world uh, at the end of the 19th century. Um, uh, and so we have a voluminous evidence about what happened and what went on. Um, and this is because it was so uh, contentious. Um, but was it new? And the answer is no. Um, uh, North Indians, who were the earliest migrants overseas to the sugar colonies, um, had been migrating. Um, we can trace their migrations back to the beginnings of the Delhi Sultanate. 
Um, their, um, their long career as migrants is evidenced in the poetry and folklore of, of the region, uh, particularly the motif of separation between the traveling husband and his wife. And we know very well from Dirk uh, Kolf's book, Naukar, Rajput, and Sepoy, how um, these migrants provided the majority of recruits to the Mughal army and then subsequently to the Bengal army of uh, the British. Um, now, um, where did they go? Well, we have um, uh, uh, quite a lot of evidence by the 1880s that, um, uh, at least by that time, Indians knew very well what, uh, uh, the, uh, what working on an overseas destination involved. Um, the various destinations were often spoken about. We have two reports from the 1880s that describe how the villagers would compare and contrast their experiences in different colonies. Um, uh, they, uh, they often spoke about Trinidad, properly known as Chinitat, or Demerera, known as Demerela. Um, Jamaica was considered the destination. Um, Trinidad was particularly po popular because in the early years of migration to Trinidad, once you served out your contract, you got a free grant of land. Um, Mauritius was popular in the 1850s um, and 60s, but by the 1880s, the decline of the sugar industry there had led to falling wages, so it was no longer such a popular destination. And this is reflected in popular uh, discourse uh, of the time. So we have a map here um, showing where they went um, and some statistics. Um, the statistics, though, are underestimates. These are all totals from um, a book by a guy called David Northrup, um, who kind of assumed that migration ended overseas, uh, indentured migration overseas ended in 1916, um, when the British said they were going to end it. In fact, the last indentured migrants were in 1924. And P Indians were re being recruited to work in the tea plantations of Assam um, as late as the 1950s. Um, um, this map shows the principal destinations in the Caribbean, in South Africa, in East Africa, in um, um, uh, the Mascarene Islands, Reunion, and um, um, uh, Mauritius, in, Fi in, in Trinidad, and uh, also, uh, sorry, in Fiji, and also in Sri Lanka. Uh, one arrow missing, though, is the, is the migration to uh, uh, Burma and Malaya, which actually was greater than the, all of the other migrations uh, to all of the other destinations. It was absolutely vast. A lot of it actually undocumented, uh, which is why it's very difficult uh, to study. Uh, these migrants, very often, the first thing they had to do was to clear the forest, and working conditions clearing the forest was often extremely arduous and not dissimilar to the sort of work that slaves did um, um, in, the, in the late 18th century. And early accommodation was very rudimentary. This is a typical coolie hut. It's a drawing from the 1840s in, in Mauritius. Um, uh, but by the 1860s, in, um, people are beginning to establish uh, more permanent settlements. Um, many of these migrants, particularly to the Caribbean and to, the, uh, to um, uh, Reunion and Mauritius, uh, decided to stay rather than to go home. They would re-indenture and stay on. And, and they began to build themselves more substantial um, homes and even begin to set up shops. Um, those uh, uh, market gardening became an important source of income. To many of those, were, many migrants would give up laboring in plantations, become market gardeners, and then retail uh, their produce um, through uh, Indian shops. And by the 1890s, we're beginning to see quite substantial properties um, and, and small towns being established in all of these um, plantation colonies. So um, the earliest Indian migrants overseas were all Bengal sepoys who were used to actually um, capture territory in, in Malaysia and Singapore, um, Mauritius, South Africa. They were often the very first Indian feet on the ground. Many of them stayed behind. They established contact with their relatives at home, which is, I think, why even in the 1830s, uh, people in Bihar and UP, where they came from, knew about these overseas destinations and uh, the potential uh, to earn good money there. However, things changed dramatically after the Great Indian Uprising of 1857. Um, um, the um, earliest migrants um, included many tribals, particularly from the Chotanagpur region. Kohl, Santals, Orans, and Mundas. Uh, some of you may have heard the great, the great Santal uprising of 1855. Um, uh, this was a region stalked by famine. It also had a long history of migration for laboring. I mean, the Sundarbans were largely cleared using um, uh, 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 tribal labor from, uh, the, from, the, uh, from the Chotanagpur region. 
Um, but after 1857, there is a dramatic change in the character of this labor force, um, as I shall illustrate. Now, these statistics show the way that um, uh, migration took off after 1857. Um, the different colored strip shows that whether they're coming from Bombay, Madras, or from Calcutta. And you'll see that the biggest rise is in the number of recruits coming from uh, Calcutta. Um, and what I did was um, uh, I, took, uh, I collected a sample of uh, the ship's lists, uh, the lists of those who were actually embarked upon ships, going to Trinidad, South Africa, Guyana, and Mauritius between 1857 and 1869. Now, these ships lists are available if you go and visit the archives in those individual countries. They're not collected together centrally anywhere. You have to go around and you have to dig them up, and sometimes they're quite hard to find. Um, uh, I took a sample of about 4,600 migrants, um, which is only about 2% of the total, but it's sufficient number to be statistically significant. And these are the places, I, and I focused only on those migrants leaving from Calcutta. Tamil migrants were more numerous in the later years, particularly after the 1870s and 1880s, particularly in Malaysia. But the earliest migrants came from UP and uh, Bihar. So I focused on Calcutta. Um, and these are the different zillas where they come from. And as you can see, there's like half a dozen uh, where uh, we produced the largest number of recruits. Now, if you then map this onto a map of North India at the time, you will see that um, these are the, the places where the migrants came from were all areas which were most profoundly affected by the uprising of 1857. To begin with, there were 100,000 sepoys in the Indian army. Uh, which mutinied in 1857. Those who were not slaughtered by the British um, were um, rendered unemployed. Their regiments were disbanded. In many cases, they were deprived of their land. Their villages were burnt to the ground. Uh, even those who sympathized with the rebels had punitive taxes levied on them, which contributed enormously to the death toll in the subsequent famines which struck North India in 1861 and 1865. So these are all seriously affected districts, um, which is where the demand from comes from, um, for opportunities to work overseas. Um, but who were these migrants? Were they really the lowest of the low, as the British Parliament was told in 1839 and 1840? And the answer is no, they were not. Um, if you actually break down the migrants by caste, and these ships' lists do all contain details, not only of their villages, where they come from, but also their castes, you will see that they're actually almost identical to uh, the cross-section of uh, North Indian society at the time, um, as evidenced by the uh, statistics given in the 1881 census. You have roughly 11% of the migrants are Brahmin and Kshatriya, compared with 12% in the population of North India at the time. Uh, roughly 11% are Vaishya and artisanal castes, which again corresponds to roughly 7% in North India at the time. So actually slightly more artisans and Vaishya are going abroad on these ships than actually are resident in North India. 18% are sort of middling agricultural caste, the same proportion as in, 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 in North India and Bengal at this time. 19% uh, of the migrants are Muslim, compared with 24% in North India at this time. There are a great many Muslims in the regiments of the Bengal army, which I think accounts for that. And only 30% uh, were uh, Dalit or back members of Dalit or backward castes, and only 5% were Adivasis, um, which uh, I think really rather eliminates this idea that they were exclusively from those sections of society. In fact, they came from all sections of society. The one thing that they shared in common was a need to find a living from their family in a very, very difficult time. Um, um, so they could be uh, of any class and ranks. Now, I'm glad to say this is not just my hunch. Oh, actually, I was very surprised by this analysis when it was finally concluded. I didn't expect it to be quite this clear-cut. Um, but it does. It has been confirmed by a study done by Bridge V. Lal of migrants uh, from North India to Fiji in the 1880s and 18, 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, who comes to a similar conclusion that, in fact, overseas migrants came from all sections of society, and people for, migrated for a variety of reasons. They're not just um, uh, unskilled um, uh, and the lowest of the low. Um, 
and they were recruited uh, by various intermediaries. It's often assumed that British government agents did the recruiting. They didn't. They just signed the bills. Uh, for the cost of recruiting. The hard work, as always, was done by Indians. Uh, Kanganis, Akatis, Dafadars, and Sirdars went out and, uh, and recruited the Indian migrants and traveled with them uh, to their destinations. These migrants maintained a close contact with home and they informed each other of pitfalls and opportunities. And many re indentured and moved on to work in, after working in one colony to work in another. Um, sharing information about the, where the best opportunities uh, were. Who were these recruiters? Well, many of them, most of them, in fact, were recruited from the ranks of former migrants. They were old migrants who, um, who became uh, sardars or foremen um, and, and were then sent home uh, to recruit from the villages where they themselves had originally come. And they would compete with each other to get the best wages from the plantation owners, particularly if they re-indentured. For their original contract, the wages were fixed, but if they chose to re-indenture and stay on, on, then you know the gloves were off, and, and there was quite fierce negotiation for wages and conditions and competition, uh, with workers absconding frequently uh, when uh, in, in en masse, uh, led by their sirdar, if uh, the conditions or the wages uh, did not meet with their expectations. Women were always a significant portion of these migrants. The, the, the regulations set down in 1843 uh, said that they should that 40 percent of the migrants should be women. Now this figure was frequently achieved in the in the case of Mauritius, um, less so with the more remote destinations such as Trinidad and and uh, Ghana. Probably the figure of 25 percent was more common there. Um, but it would, right from the start, what the uh, government wanted to do was to establish a settled population. They didn't simply want to recruit men and then to get rid of them when they were no longer needed. Um, many women, though, did all, uh, travel with their husbands, but many did also travel alone due to a combination of circumstances such as early widowhood and relatives who are unable or unwilling to support them. And some, indeed, even indentured to uh, elope to avoid marriage, as in the case of one migrant that I've written about, a woman called Sin Singaria, a tribal woman who was a migrant uh, to Assam in 1905. While fraud was evident in some cases, women were not, for the most part, passive victims, and some even became recruiters themselves. And they played a very important role. In Assam, of course, women were the majority of the workforce. They were the tea pickers. Um, in um, Mauritius, uh, they didn't work in uh, cutting the sugar cane, but they provide a, a valuable support to their laboring sons and husbands, and would often uh, take, part, uh, take part in other forms of buy employment, uh, um, uh, setting up little industries, laundries, and uh, retailing of their own on the side to supplement their family income. Um, uh, they corresponded with home, and they also helped to recreate and sustain religious and cultural condition, uh, uh, traditions. Um, some even became very successful entrepreneurs in their own right, um, inherit becoming substantial property owners and using their wealth to set up community organizations, religious institutions, and family businesses. They could indeed even become for, uh, overseers on estates, such as uh, Sukunia, who was in charge of 16 men on this Clemenceau estate and Clemencia estate in Mauritius in the 1870s, um, which is, reflects on the way another thing that migration allowed, and this was opportunities to do things that you could not do at home. And this was particularly for important for women. They enjoyed newfound liberties, which often were a source of considerable controversy. Frequent complaints, I've just been reading in the files in the Malaysian archives, men complaining about their women being enticed away uh, by other men and demanding that the colonial government intervene uh, to bring back their wives to them. Because the, the frequently women would leave a husband that they found unsatisfactory and move on to another one, which was, un which of course, was impossible in Indian conditions, but could be done overseas. Um, um, this is often taken as an example of immorality, but I would argue quite the opposite. It's a sign of women exerting their independence in ways that they had not been able to enjoy uh, before. Um, one of the more entertaining stories of a successful woman is the Queen of Sheba, as she was dubbed by the captain of the clipper ship Angel, bound for the West Indies in 1878. This woman had made herself a small fortune in, 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 um, in Trinidad, and she, but she decided that she wanted to go back to India. She bought, she paid for her own ticket back to India. Um, 
Uh, she'd made a fortune, it's, uh, his account says, partly by ju judicial marriages and as a trader, um, but in, in time a longing came over her to return to the land of, of her birth, but a short experience was enough for her. Uh, she said when she got back she was asked to pay huge sums of money by the priest of her village um, and, and she declined and uh, uh, decided that she wanted to go back to Trinidad after all. Her comment being, India, only fit place for coolies. She, the interesting thing about her is on their way back to Trinidad, when their ship stopped at, Trini, uh, at, uh, at, Saint, at the port of St. Helena, she bought up all the fish in the local fish market in order to throw a feast for the other passengers on the ship. And according to the description, she was a sight to look at when she was fully dressed, loaded with jewellery all over her person, as was the custom in Trinidad and Guyana. Um, immensely heavy silver bracelets. If you had money, you wore it all the time, not just on special occasions. So um, heavy silver bracelets uh, from elbows to the shoulder, from the wrist to the elbow, and ankles to knees, a diamond di diadem on the forehead, rings on all fingers and toes, a pendant rose rings, and earlobes decorated with holes big enough to admit bottle corks. Um, uh, this is why she was dubbed the Queen of Sheba. Um, it creates a, a striking image um, um, uh, and shows how even in, as early as the 1860s individuals could strike rich abroad. They were not all uh, tragic victims. But one of the things I want to stress most of all is the role of the intermediaries known as Sirdars, Sardars in North India, Kanganis or Maestris in, Sanda, in, South, I in South India or Mandors in, Manda, in, in Malay. Uh, they were overseas recruiters, foremen, and labor, labor representatives. Um, uh, they were described often as parasitic middlemen and traffickers, but I would argue they are essential in any economic system. Um, they were reviled by the sugar and rubber planters and were a common cause of complaint, but I like to focus on them because I think they are very clear evidence of informal social organization within the labor economy. Um, the intermediaries in Assam received a, a similar bad press to those overseas in the sugar colonies and rubber colonies. In Assam, they, uh, they were described as the scum of the country, ex-convicts, burglars, thieves, dacoits, and notorious budmushes. Um, um, but other sources describe them as belonging to the very class of people who migrate as laborers and live and move among them. And the reality is, of course, what the British defined as abuse or corruption was simply an instance of an Indian making money at their expense. And in the exam, they made huge amounts of money. It cost about three to four times more to recruit a laborer to work in Assam than it did to recruit a laborer to work overseas because there were so many middlemen taking money along the way. Uh, it was a hugely profitable industry um, for all concerned. Um, um, the, um, uh, um, the protector of immigrants, Anderson, in 1846, wrote as follows. N and I think it's a really interesting quote, this. No immigrant ever forms an engagement for himself or even communicates with the planter who is standing before him for the purpose of obtaining his services. They invariably and implicitly follow the will and directions of the surdar to whom they have given their confidence. The idea of the British was is that they wanted to create a workforce of autonomous individuals who, with whom the, 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 the planter could directly contract on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, he would stand before them and recruit their services. But that's not the way the Indians wanted to work. They wanted to work as groups, uh, with a foreman who would act as their spokesman, and only if they were all satisfied would they actually then collectively agree to be engaged uh, by a planter. These old emigrants who act as sirdars were very, very important. In fact, they supplied the majority of the recruits to South Africa and uh, the Masquerine Islands, um, um, as shown by the statistics of the time. Rather arrogantly, the 1875 Royal Commission on Agriculture took plenty of evidence, lots of evidence on, 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 the, uh, on this migration overseas, and they concluded, notwithstanding the many objections that there are, both theoretically and in practice to the Sirdar system, it is one so entirely with the consonant and habits and customs of the natives of India that we fear there will be great difficulty in breaking it through it. So although they depended... Uh, Although they, they depended utterly on these, these intermediaries, somehow the British nonetheless despised them and looked down on them. And I think it's because they gave, actually gave them such a hard time. Um, the Kangani in Malaysia 
and Sri Lanka was exactly the same uh, as the Sirdar in, in, in Mauritius or in South Africa. Each Kangani, according to R.K. Jain, recruited a score or more of men belonging mainly to his own caste and king group. And from about the turn of the century, migration by families was the predominant form. Sometimes several emigrant bands under its own leader combined under the overall direction of a high caste Kangani. And he, he would lend money to people who could not afford the passage. And that's one of the ways that he exercised influence over the group. This is a photograph from that era of a typical Calcutta band of coolies um, uh, who were similarly organized. Arian Dahan has written, the process of recruitment for the uh, jute, uh, mil jute, and other, jute mills and other industries of Calcutta has been predominantly per personalistic. Recruitment was and still is mainly through personal relations. And perhaps I would suggest you might like to look at your own lives and wonder to what extent does that still apply to the present day? Now, we would like to imagine now we're all modern and we live in a world where everything is designed by um, competitive examination um, and meritocracy and as individuals selling themselves on the labor market and individuals relating as individuals relate to the state. But in fact, these informal relationships and networks are vitally important to every economy and uh, not least of all in Singapore, as I've been hearing today. The, the, these intermediaries um, could go under another name. One of them, a rather more modern sounding name, is that of contractor. Um, and Akbar Shah was one of the more successful contractors of the colonial era. He was a Patan who, in the 1890s, recruited 200 and Afridis and Patans to undertake contract work, first in the Punjab, then on the Assam Bengal Railway in Assam, and then he moved to, to, to Yangon where his men worked in the quarries providing stone for the reconstruction of the docks. Within three years, he'd muscled out his rivals and had become the sole contractor with 700 to 800 labor, Indian laborers in his pay. And he was described at that time as the largest Indian uh, labor contractor in the British Empire. His brother, Ajab Ghul, then took a party of 200 Patans to Sri Lanka to undertake work on a railway extension in Ratnapura. Um, in other words, he was a very enterprising and successful man whose work ranged all around the Indian Ocean. Unfortunately, he came, he came, to, he came to, um, uh, to, into difficulties in 1915 when there was a, a mutiny of a Punjab, regime, of a Punjab resident, a regiment in Singapore uh, with which um, intelligence agents suspected him of being in some way involved. And when news of this spread to Colombo, and um, Akbar Shah tried to travel uh, to Colombo in order to take over uh, the business which his brother was running there. He was uh, detained and deported. And his brother was subsequently arrested uh, when he went back to India and imprisoned by the Madras authorities. The laborers being repatriated to northwest provinces in groups of 50 via Mumbai. And this is the beginning of the kind of Muslim Islamophobia of uh, which uh, kind of gripped the British from this time onwards. Um, um, uh, the idea that they were cons fermenting conspiracy, of course, began with the conflict with the Ottoman Empire in the First World War. Um, um, now, how were these long distance migrations uh, enabled? Well, one of the most important thing factors in this migration was trust. Uh, trust was essential to long-distance migration. Um, trust mainstreamed through kith and kin relationships, through caste councils, uh, through religious authorities, and the various intermediaries um, whom I have mentioned. Now, trust has been a major theme in economic writing in recently, and I have a few words to say about that, because uh, trust is imagined as being primarily something that can only be upheld by fully and efficiently functioning courts and a fair and honest um, police and judiciary. Um, but uh, the world of the Kangani and the Sardar, which I've, talk which I've been talking about, is a world where, in fact, trust is upheld through informal social relations. And there is a parallel economy of informal trust that goes along with the state-sponsored trust to enable uh, this long-distance migration. And without the former, um, I argue, you know, these migrations would never have been possible. Um, 
The government tried to create trust by creating, using a lot of official documentations. Government noticed, notices um, uh, promoted the idea that somehow this overseas migration was sponsored, encouraged for, uh, and encouraged by the government. That migrants were in some sense working for the Sarkar or the East India Company. And this provided an important factor in reassuring the migrants. Um, uh, the, Documents that they would sign, the indentured contracts, were written in multiple languages to make sure people understood what they were committing to. They would also have to appear before a magistrate to confirm that they actually understood what they were doing and that they were not actually simply being duped into signing these contracts. Um, um, groups of laborers would sometimes collectively sign contracts, and we have examples of contracts signed by multiple people, which shows how right from the village they decided that they were going to migrate together as a group. And the returnee recruiters would carry letters with them. Um, they were often harassed by the police when they went back home, demanding bribes uh, of one sort or another. The returning recruiters would therefore carry with them, note, with them letters saying uh, that they are basically people of good character um, uh, who are got, have come to recruit um, and they carry with them money and that they should not be disturbed in their business. Um, this helped to build uh, trust uh, when they arrived back to, into India. Um, another place where co trust was established was in the depot. Migrants would, would, would travel for days and days to get to the depot, and then they might wait there for weeks before they finally uh, uh, f uh, found a ship to take them to their destination. And it's here that they would learn more from ex-migrants, uh, previous old re re returnee recruiters, about what to expect, who amongst them might be the better foreman, and where might be the best place to go. Um, so this is an important centre of exchange. But it's at this point that the world of official documentation and official trust gives way to the world of informal trust, where the Sirdar actually is the person who they turn to principally for reassurance, not the magistrate, not the colonial government, but the Sirdar. Um, then the Sirdar would support them in all sorts of different ways. Um, one of the most important things is he would retain a portion of the monthly wages of the labourer, a, wa a form of saving which was returned when a labourer wished to, to, to send money home or to go back to the subcontinent or if he was ill and could not work and his pay was docked. The Sudar would also lend money for special purposes such as marriages. And most interestingly, he would pool, often pool the wages from his uh, workers, from his gang, and then redistribute them uh, at the end of the month. Now, this is very important in some of these colonies, not least of all in Mauritius. If you took a day off work because you were ill without authorization, you would be docked do two days' pay. This was the so-called double cut, uh, which was widely considered to be unfair. Um, and the Sirdar would basically subvert this by pooling all the wages and then dividing them amongst the workers according to the numbers of days worked, ignoring the double cut. Um, uh, Rudel, the owner of the La Barak plantation, Grandport, uh, noticed this practice of stopping uh, the wages and, and putting them all into one bag and redistributing them. He'd no idea why they were doing it and thought it was, it was and banned the practice. But this is one of the ways we know that it was going on. Um, um, but the, the Sudars would also uh, compete with each other to try to get um, uh, the best terms for their workers. And it was commented in 1865 um, um, uh, by one official, the competition now existing uh, between the planter and the job contractor is generally some old Sardar is, is always able to offer higher wages, exemption from discipline, and continual leave, uh, leave of absence with the same guarantee to the labor for the payment of his wages um, is now entirely in favor of the latter. In, uh, I've rephrased this. The Sardar, in other words, has a very strong bargaining position. He's, off, he's able to offer workers. He would do a deal with the planter to offer them much better wages, much better conditions. And, and because there was a shortage of labor, he often would uh, win the day in negotiations. Um, so why are these Sardars or, uh, so, uh, or Kanganis so notorious? Well, it's because they are, to use a term from, from English literature, liminal characters. They're kind of in between. They don't fit into any of the categories of formal um, uh, uh, political economy. Uh, they breach national boundaries. They move, help to move people from one country to another. They defy territorial ideas of citizenship. They serve both employers and laborers. 
and they inhabit the world of the informal economy. We only get to hear about them when things go horribly wrong, when there are complaints and, and court cases, and they come to the notice of the, of the colonial government. This is one of the reasons why they have a, a bad reputation. But for every one Sirdar who gets a bad reputation and gets prosecuted before the courts for stealing money, uh, there are hundreds who are doing, actually, I would argue, quite a good job um, in, in, in resolving disputes and, uh, and ensuring uh, the best condition from their workers. If we look at the evidence of the Royal Commission of Mauritius of 1875, it's very interesting. You look at the evidence in detail. All of these abuses being described by the planters are, in fact, if you look at them quite closely, examples of the Sirdars outwitting their employers. Um, um, the, um, Mr. Daly says very simply, um, they take from the hands of men after receiving the money, the, the amount they have, they require to have paid to them. Um, in other words, they are pooling their money. Uh, and they enslave their me men by means of loans and advances. Well, we're all enslaved by loans and advances. Um, uh, I'm enslaved by my mortgage to my uh, bank. Um, uh, but it's one I'm quite willing, uh, as a form of slavery I'm quite willing to subject myself to. It simply depends on your point of view. Uh, they might regard this, the workers themselves, as a rather generous form of patronage. Mr. Rouillard said, um, the Sirdars live upon the Indians. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, engage in transactions with the, in, with the laborers which embarrass them. The, and then he has a very interesting argument. The workers there then become disgusted and indifferent to their work and abscond, while the Sirdar himself never reports where absentees are, although he knows their whereabouts. In other words, somehow the Sirdar is encouraging people to not work too hard, and if they run away, he knows where they are, but he won't say. This tells, I think, a rather different story than what the planter is trying to relate. And finally, I like this one, Mr. Martin said, the Sirdar does not make the men work as well and properly as they might. Uh, which is another way of saying he's organizing them to resist the importunate demands of their employer. Um, uh, so, as I said, activities which were seen as abuses were, in reality, instances, I would argue, of nor North Indians profiting at the expense of Europeans. But there were, amongst the litany of complaints, voices of, of dissent. Uh, Mr. Antelm um, said that the Sardars are intelligent and useful, um, and uh, that often they're the real sufferers when wages are not paid in full, because they are the ones who have committed to pay their workers. Um, and that they were often paid more, but they were sometimes paid out of their own pockets um, so that workers who had uh, absented themselves through illness would not uh, suffer uh, a loss of income and rations. Um, so we can see that some of these sardars were indeed benevolent. Now, one of the, I've got a couple of other issues I want to touch upon which before I conclude, and one of those is the issue of, of caste. Um, uh, I've said that migration could allow great opportunities for women to enjoy freedoms that they might not hitherto have enjoyed. Caste uh, boundaries were also eroded by migration. They were not eliminated completely because people migrated often in groups from their own villages, um, and they would often mess together on, at the depot and in, on the ship. But nonetheless, they would mess together, they would eat together cheek by jowl, one group with the next group. For this reason, this forced commensality aboard the ships led to often people being referring to themselves as jahajibai, as brothers of the journey. Um, um, and so uh, the, the, the travel overseas did not destroy caste distinctions, but it certainly did erode it to a very uh, considerable extent. And that continued on the estate because um, there was no inequality about workers. I mean, regardless of your your rank, you would still be required to do the same amount of work. So Dr. Moat, who visited Mauritius in 1852, said, the Indians are better off than at Madras, and when they return, they do so as men and not as slaves. Free of the chains of caste, they are ready to needle and to defy both the priest in the temple and the zamindar. And the historian Dharma Kumar has concluded that migrants often return with greater knowledge of agricultural techniques and a less willingness to abide by caste restrictions. And it certainly is uh, the case that gradually you will see not necessarily the elimination of caste. It, it ceases to be something uh, that is vital to their lives, but merely a cultural practice within two or three generations. Um, and within, by the fourth generation, intermarriage between caste becomes quite the norm. Um, 
So to conclude, um, where does this project lead us? Um, well, it leads us very broadly to the conclusion that in South Asia is not the static and conservative society as depicted in Orientalist colonial sources, and indeed, as some even still imagine in the present day, uh, but there is, in fact, a long history of migration in North India and elsewhere. Um, there is, despite the assertion of colonial officials, substantial evidence that high caste and skilled laborers, even ex sepoys, were recruited for indentured migration overseas. Workers commonly moved from one category of labor to another. They weren't bound by their caste to a particular trade. Um, um, and interestingly, the presence of ex sepoys was in the sugar colonies was used by later newspaper colonists in Ghana, F Ghana and Fiji to explain the militancy of their workers and the fact that they were beginning to organize and, and put demands to their employers. Um, Women played an important role in overseas labor migration, which has been us un underestimated. But perhaps most importantly, pyramids of informal, effective networks of trust were crucial to overseas migration as in the past, as they are in the present, as indeed they are in all economic uh, relationships. And they are all more often harmonious and effective than official archives and li uh, literature might lead us to believe. Um, intermediaries were crucial in providing information, mediating and establishing contrast in, in, in contractual informal relationships, especially where there was no fully functioning court system which could be relied upon to perform these roles. I think the neglect of this role of intermediaries suggests a need for us to decolonize our historical and sociological thought and to perhaps allow them a greater importance and a more respect in the study of present development issues. And indeed, my wife is currently doing work on uh, uh, gurus in South India uh, who play a very important role as intermediaries in the informal uh, economy of, of Karnataka. Um, my hope is that at the end of this project, the books that come out of this, and we're publishing a whole series of books, are with the, we've started up a series with OUP uh, Delhi on, on the global South Asian diaspora. Um, my hope is that out of, out of this, we will be able to encourage um, Indians overseas to have far more pride in the achievements of their ancestors and to kind of rewrite the history of victimhood, which has sort of been with us ever since the nationalist era, into one that is much more constructive and relevant uh, to the present day. Um, as has been done, for example, for, for the story of, of, of uh, convict migration uh, to Australia. Um, um, so I think this whole story of Indian overseas migration needs to be written, written, uh, re written anew. And we need to face the fact that actually Indians played as prominent, important, at least an important role in the development of the colonial South in the colonial era um, right up to the late uh, mid 20th century, at least as important a role as Europeans. Um, Finally, I'll end up with some pictures. Um, this is a Sirdar's house from the early 20th century. If you look inside his house, you'll see that he has brass pots and implements, uh, showing that he's, he's doing reasonably well. This is an example of the type of ships registered from which we get all the information about who the migrants were and uh, where they come from. Uh, this is a similar emigration certificate for Trinidad and another one uh, for Guyana, um, providing lots of information about their uh, they're married, where they're married, their age, uh, their father's name, um, even an interesting section indicated called marks, um, in which unique characteristics were recorded. Um, colonial documents, of course, which only tell half the story. But also we have um, petitions and other sort of documents written by the migrants themselves, uh, which I've been reading a lot of, uh, or written on behalf of migrants by petition writers, in which they tell about their problems and experiences. But we even have letters written by migrants. Whenever someone uh, posts a letter, and it doesn't arrive in, 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 in the, its destination. It goes into the dead letter collection, or the, in, which is there is, a, there is actually a dead letter office yes. in Calcutta. Uh, and often migrants would move on from one plantation to another, and the letter they had sent would not be de de delivered. So it would go back to the post office. It would be kept, because if well, someone wanted to recover it at a later date, they could be charged a fee. So dead letters were valuable. They weren't thrown away. The British also wanted to check up on this correspondence. So they, in, they did actually intercept and translate quite a lot of these letters going home as well. 
Um, so we have actually the largest collection of these letters are from Fiji and Mauritius, and they're written in all sorts of different languages, as indeed the migrants came from all different parts of India. <coughs> this is a letter in Urdu, written from uh, Said um, uh, Ul Nisa Begum in India to her husband in Mauritius. This is another letter written in 1881 from Narayanan in Mauritius uh, back home. And this is a letter in Hindi uh, by Man Sahai to his family in, in, religion, in, in Mauritius in, 19, uh, in, from, uh, in 1947. And these are some of the pictures of the migrants themselves. From the 1870s onwards, they actually started, when people arrived, taking photographs of them. So we have a fo there is also a photographic record of many of these indentured migrants. Not for the Kangani migrants or the free migrants, who, took, took up a, who were a majority of the migrants overseas, but for the indentured migrants we have, which government assumed direct responsibility for, we have a photographic collection. So this is a Gurdin Chama from Gorakhpur from Mauritius in 1884. This woman is interesting, Sajahi Dosaj, obviously a low caste migrant, but an old migrant, a widow. She obviously is one of those who decided to stay on. Um, um, uh, this photograph is from 1899. This one is of a couple who married a couple who migrated, Buljur Roy and his wife Reshmi. Um, who arrived in 1882 and 1888. Notice the time gap. He obviously came out on his own and then went back and brought his wife back to Mauritius with him. And finally, my favorite, this is a picture postcard from 1905 um, from Trinidad, uh, a, a picture of a wealthy coolie merchant's miss, who is how I imagine the Queen of Sheba looking in the 1870s, covered and bedecked with jewels to show off uh, her family's prosperity. Okay, that is all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Crispin, for a hugely enjoyable talk. Um, I welcome Dr. Anu Jale from the South Asia Study Program. Anu, there is a place waiting for you. Come, come and join us there. OK, but uh, that will help you get into the conversation. It's entirely for Twitter that 70 years ago, roughly at this time, Jawaharlal Nehru would have announced the birth of a nation, um, long suppressed, finds utterance. And if I had heard this lecture when I was a student, I would have understood why Nehru's words would 70 years later become what we are today, that the picture of a static conservative society was an orientalist construction of what pre-independence India might have been like. That there are lots of people on the move. And um, if you're looking for a picture for your book, I would put the Chamar fellow because the Chamar fellow exudes the agency that you're talking about. Look at the mm. way he looks at the camera. He's mm. not shying away from it. Never mind he's a Chamar, but he is an agent of his own destiny. Mm. Of course, there are two constructions. Either the, um, I mean, it's a free market. You're going for the best wages, a kind of Lockean society, or you're tricked into it, that you are a victim of circumstances. These are the two sort of diametrically opposite constructions you can put on the story. I tend to take a middle ground, and I've always argued, like Marx did, that man makes history within conditions imposed by history, that your agents are not completely free agents, but they're not completely enslaved by the circumstances either. I mean, if you're looking for a literary construction of the uh, historical scenarios that Crispin is talking about, you have to look at two books. I mean, A House for Mr. Bishwas of Naipal is one kind, and uh, The Sea of Poppies of uh, Amitabh Ghosh is yet another. The thing to remember about the Ghosh trilogy is that the entire story is told by Ditti, a woman. Mm. And you see everything, including the Jahaji Bhais, um, through her eyes. So. That is roughly my takeaway from this, that we are policy analysts here, but policy analysis needs a body, a body on which one can graft one's specific stories of elections or negotiations or building of institutions, or for that matter, the creation of politics. Remember, in a properly Lockean society, there will be no room for politics. But the Sardar, the liminal creature who works on trust, 
then gets people to stick their necks out. Because if some people didn't, there would be only market and no politics. So many post-independence developments must have had this kind of pre-independence But it, it begins in the 1930s with strikes being organized, or even the 1920s with strikes being organized. These escalate during the 1930s. People begin to invite uh, INC speakers from India to come and address their, the workers. Mm -hmm. So actually, these sardars are intimately, and the organization of these workers is intimately related to the development of politics, which okay. begins even before independence. Wonderful. I would now start the general conversation, engage him. Um, Anish. Yes, uh, yes uh, hello, Professor. My name is Anish Mishra. And thank you very much for the brilliant um, presentation. I was actually astonished with the accuracy of your presentation. The reason why is that you know your presentation actually is a story of, my, of myself. Um, I come from a migrant family as well. The difference is that you know, my family migrated one generation later than this, between 1890s to 1910s. I don't know the exact um, year, but I'm from uh, the... Uh, uh, Azam Girl district of the United United Province. And yes, so that, that's why I think it's, uh, you know, very accurate. I mean, one point I want to actually point out to you, you spoke about, you know, that, you know, the, the families that migrated here were not necessarily socially backward. You know, they were quite advanced. And, you know, that actually resonates with myself because, you know, we were, you know, uh, uh, women cast, landowners, and and very fast within one generation, there was a very high um, social, social mobility. We improve and that kind of things. Okay, uh, my, my question is actually um, related to the year 1857, one thing I noticed in this uh, presentation, which you didn't actually um, point out to, you see, in 1857, the, s the significant thing that, that happened was, you know, the, the last Mughal Emperor, Badu Shah Zafar, was sent to, to Rangoon, fall of the Mughal Empire. But it was in that year where the, where the, where the British Raj was established, because actually that, that war was not really unsuccessful. It was the end of company rule in India. So personally, I, I think, you know, if, if you're Indian, you should consider yourself a slave for 90 years, most of, uh, from 1857 to 1947. So what, what was this? Is there any significant thing of the establishment of the British Raj instead of the company rule that actually f facilitated the, the, um, the, the migration of uh, the North Indians? Thanks. Crispin, hold it. I will take a couple more questions, then uh, you'll pull them together. I'll now invite Dr. Chaudhary to ask his question. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Professor, for an excellent presentation, uh, most enjoyable. Uh, two questions. One is, um, say, the uh, uh, not so much 1857, but 1793, for instance, the Permanent Settlement Act. Wouldn't it have some impact in encouraging people to, uh, those peasants who had very tenuous relationship with the land, because the zamindars paid their uh, uh, revenue in uh, perpetuity to the state? which means that the zamindar could exploit the peasant as much as, uh, as they could. So wouldn't that lead to the first wave of mi migration rather than 1857? In other words, I'm saying that the wave would have begun earlier than 1857. Secondly, uh, what is the connection? I mean, is, doesn't it flow almost seamlessly into the problems of uh, the contractual labor today? which is very relevant to the economies of our countries now. I mean, what's, what's the difference? Um, if the contractual, like uh, Mr. Uh, Biswas could uh, aspire to a house in, in Trinidad, but today's, of course, contractual labor cannot aspire to a house in Dubai because he can't live there forever. His is really a contract. It's three years to five years. But those contractual labor, obviously, I mean, uh, indentured labor obviously stayed on. Uh, mm -hmm. straight on in Trinidad uh, and elsewhere. So what is the difference with the present-day contractual labor? Is it not a continuation of the same story? Okay, hang on. I'll have a last question, a third question from... You want to come? Okay. Then go on. Uh, uh, yes. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll begin with the, um, the contract labor. Um, uh, well, one of the big differences between then and now, of course, is that national boundaries are much, much, much stronger now. And where kind of uh, intermediaries, labor intermediaries were tolerated in the past, uh, nowadays um, uh, they're called smugglers or even traffickers, um, and uh, they're often prosecuted. Um, um, but they are very similar 
in their roles and functions. And there are good smugglers and there's bad smugglers. Um, and there's good traffickers and bad traffickers. Um, 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 I, uh, they are very important in the plantation economy even today, um, and also in the construction industry, in supplying labor which is not available at the rate which manufacturers and producers want in the locality. I was um, only last Friday in a, a plantation in the Cameron Highlands, a tea plantation, and um, uh, talking to the workers, and they nearly all came from uh, Nepal and from Bangladesh um, as single men. And they were, uh, they were, I don't think they were all legal workers. I think some of them were illegal migrants. And they'd been hired because they would accept wages that were much long, lower than the local Tamils. The local Tamil plantation workers are all moved on to other forms, other occupations. Um, so now they're applying Nepalis and, and, and Bangladeshis because they're, they're cheaper. So I think the lessons of the past are very relevant to the present day. And then you have to ask yourself, well, how is this to be? How is this to be managed? And <clears throat> you know, often, often uh, what the answer is is, oh, we need to crack down on the smugglers. We need to crack down the traffickers. You know, they're the bad guys in this. Um, but actually, I, the, the employers themselves are, are, are intimately involved with these traffickers and their smugglers. They, uh, they, the, uh, they are supplying a need in the market. Uh, and so, what is actually needed is closer regulations of the industries. Uh, pl remote plantations, um, domestic work, the construction industry, sex work, these are where illegal workers often end up. And the solution is not, you know, the vain pursuit of traffickers and smugglers who are simply doing what the de market demands, they're meeting a market demand at both ends, demand and supply, but actually better regulation of the industries themselves, which is what happened with indentured labor migration. By the end of the 19th century, it was the most highly regulated industry in the world. And a very interesting article has been written by Rachel Sturman about, um, the, interna about the ILO when that was set up by the League of Nations in 1922 and they started formulating charters of workers' rights and good practice, good employment practice to be promulgated throughout the world, um, uh, they looked to indentured labor migration regulations, sugar plantations particularly, to as for a model on how these workers' rights should be defined. Um, and the rights of workers need to be upheld in all industries, and that is the solution to the problem of um, illegal migration. Uh, it can be made legal if the industries are properly regulated, as indeed happened with indentured migration. Um, now we have much more regular, much more strict citizenship regime. Uh, you don't need to be a citizen to have rights. In, you can be a migrant laborer, but you, you, you won't be exploited if the industry is properly regulated. Exploitation only arises when the industry is not. Uh, in those days, they could, yes. Yeah. But, but the contractual labor can't... Uh, no, no. Well, this is why, indeed, in colonial... In, 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 in de indeed, in colonial times, you could argue that these migrant labor's, you know, conditions and the outcomes were much, much better than migrant laborers in the present day. Yes. I mean, people assume that somehow we're more modern and progressive, but actually the opportunities were far better in colonial That's times for many of these people. Um, uh, to to uh, go back to the Raj and the changes that brought about, well, obviously much, much closer supervision from London, which didn't always meet with the demands of the colonies. The colonies wanted a light touch. They didn't want to be too closely monitored in their work. But m London had to uh, balance the demands of the different colonies. And whilst you know Trinidad or South Africa or Mauritius were desperate for Indian labor, um, D uh, Delhi was not so keen. But the Madras presidency, in particular, was very uh, resistant. They, in fact, they completely they refused to allow indentured migration to, to Sri Lanka. They said, "No, we're not having that. You know, it's we, we much prefer the free migration system." And indeed, in in Malaysia, many years before uh, uh, indenture was abolished, indentured migration was abolished in 1916. It had been entirely given up. Um, in, in the rubber and uh, uh, industry. Um, they found that actually the free migrants were much more 
hardworking, much more um, uh, efficient, and uh, they didn't desert as frequently as indentured migrants. And so, and there was less uh, less regulation, so they actually preferred free migration to uh, or Kangani migration to indentured migration. So um, I think there was more supervision after 1857, um, which is why we have quite a lot of uh, a lot of records which we can refer to. Before 1857, well. What were the causes of the Indian uprising? The Indian East India Company really was a bandit enterprise. So, yes, there were a lot of abuses, uh, a lot more abuses at that time. Okay, we will open the second round now. Um, I've got three names. Uh, I've got uh, Dr. Anu Jale, I've got myself, uh, then Dr. Dipinder. Um, but before I open the round, you might want to uh, look up a debate um, about uh, life under slavery were slaves better off than the unslaved equivalents. That was a debate between a historian called Genovese. Um, the book is called Roll, Jordan, Roll. It's Jordan of the ship. Um, the opposite argument came from Engerman, the historian who measured the food intake of slaves and showed that those in slavery were better fed than free men under similar conditions. It can but happen, which, which is why this kind of Lockean definition yeah. of freedom yes. is, so, is, so, is, so, yes. is so useless. You know, yeah. there's, it's actually a continuum yeah. in which all sorts of conditions can be met better and worse, can be found under different labor regimes. Good. Uh, that yeah. would be for your next article for Comparative mm. Studies in Society and History, and I'll get a footnote. Oh, great. Not having <laughs> instigated. OK, now for the three questions. Anu? Sorry, I, I enjoyed your paper very much. And I worked a bit on the Biharis um, with Joya Chatterjee on the book, The Bengal Diaspora. And I was glad to see that a lot of the things we've argued, you've also come to the same conclusions. And it's true. We've also said that it was um, in a family, for example, the more able body than the smarter who would migrate. Mm. And it usually, we, you know, doing just between the the along the Bengal frontier, um, you know, and over only 60 years, um, sometimes 70, 80, sometimes 100, but not beyond, <coughs> we saw that it was very often those who were, um, you know, who, who could move, who were smart, who were adventurous that would really leave and make fortune. That was interested in knowing uh, more about um, the relationships between castes and between religions in these places and between the sardas you know who <coughs> so for example you said you know 11% uh, brahmins left what kind of work did they end up doing were they also sardars with brahmins under them you know it would seem surprising that you had brahmin indentured laborers but or then were they the uh, so w what did they do thanks very much my question i caught a word uh, in one of the um, colonial acts that you're talking about, which uh, caught my attention, the word is badmash. Now, uh, badmash is uh, a bad character that mm. goes straight from Hindi or Hindustani to Anglo-Indian. So who are the badmashes? What is their social construction? And is it one way of uh, um, sort of um, putting a discipline or control on certain characters who were resisting authority. Because we have seen similar constructions of thuggies or criminal mm. tribes, mm. or uh, for that matter, uh, the whole myth that Bengalis are effeminate and therefore Bengal mm. regiment had to be dismantled. Mm. And uh, having killed rather large uh, numbers of Europeans, they were I deemed mean, effeminate. Yes, there's <laughs> the, the, the whole, I mean, the whole colonial <coughs> strategy mm. of giving a bad name to a particular social category, and then letting that title become a reality by its own right, mm. so that you would automatically think of a Bengali a certain way or a badmash as a certain way, and then you'll have to produce a character of good conduct or certificate of good character. A uh, character certificate, which goes down all the way to our times mm. for certain jobs, you have to produce a conduct of uh, a certificate of good conduct or good character. Mm. So, what, as a historian, uh, colonial historian, could you explain to me? Uh, was it an Indian practice that the British took over, or was it a British colonial innovation as a part of governance by stealth, as I call it? 
Anyway, that was my question. Now, Dipinda. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kristen. Really enjoyed your presentation. Um, if, if you have a chance, and uh, you haven't already done so, you may want to visit the India Heritage Center. Uh, this is in Little India. It documents the diaspora. So, so what was the, the name? The India it? Heritage Center. Right. It's a newly established place in Little India. And it's fairly. It's got a limited collection, but fairly well curated. So in recent months, both Bridgelal and Sunil Amrith uh, were giving talks. Bridgelal, of course, was talking about um, the, the migration to, the, to Fiji, and uh, there was the reverse flow to some extent as well. Well, Sunil Amrith was talking about migration across the Bay of Bengal. Now, I'm, I'm trained in economics, and I was trying to glean those aspects. Uh, one of the things that struck me was, if you look, contrast migration from the south, it was uh, in large measure the Chetiars, the like instance of migrants following trade and commerce to facilitate. Um, it's the equivalent of modern day bankers. Um, likewise, there, there was a far more diverse set of groups going to Burma uh, in, in those days, partly for helping with the colonial administration and others going in for commerce. Um, the Sardars were curiously missing in the narratives, uh, in, in, in those narratives. Uh, is this an institution that is confined primarily to migration to, uh, to, to the Caribbean? So, so you're talking about the narratives of Sunil Amrit? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so this is across from the Bay of Bengal. Yeah. And there was a fairly <coughs> heterogeneous group. I mean, there's some similar to the Chetiars. Yeah. Others were facilitating colonial administrators. <coughs> Uh, and so this is relatively modern, post 1857, of course. Yeah. Um, and then there was the ones in, you know, the plantation, of course, which you alluded to in, 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 in Malaysia. Um, so yeah, my, my I, I can answer that question we, very simply, which is sure. that, there, there, I mean, Sunil Amit's book, I, I, I enjoyed reading, um, but there are some profound absences and silences in it. Um, he. He, he, his sort of innovation is to try to put the story of migration in a, con a wider context that includes environmental change. Um, that is an innovation and a very interesting one. But in terms of the story of migration itself, he pretty much sticks to the kind of old nationalist, uh, Indian nationalist tropes about migration, which comes from you know, the, um, the debates around the abolition of indenture. Um, um, and yes, so he doesn't pay any attention to intermediaries at all. Uh, they're not discussed. I mean, Kangani is enormously present in all of the literature, uh, and so are Chetiyas and and other you know Indian traders. And and they get uh, he he does say something about Indian traders, um, but he doesn't talk about the Chetiyas. He doesn't he has a little bit about the Chetiyas, but not much. And he doesn't talk about the Kanganis at no, all, um, which I think is a, a huge gap because these people often became you know the successful retailers and businessmen of, of, of later years. Um, 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 the Chetias um, were absolutely vital to the economy of, of, of large parts of Malaysia and, and, and Myanmar in, in the colonial era. I mean, they're all over the colonial documents. Every, I mean, um, people are taking loans from them right, left, and center. Um, um, by the nine, and when the depression hit, um, uh, of course, huge bankruptcies erupted, and the, ben ben the Chetias found themselves as the largest landowners in, in, in Burma or Myanmar by 1935 because of um, um, uh, defaulting on, on loans, which gives us a, a, a measure of how important that they were important to the economy up until that date. Unfortunately, the, the, the Depression and the Second World War pretty much ruined their business, and uh, they kind of withdrew entirely from... Uh, um, the Southeast Asian economy, but they are enormously visible, enormously present. Um, um, I said Indian workers and Chetia bankers basically built Malaysia and uh, and 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 Myanmar throughout much of uh, the colonial period, and, and but they've all kind of most of them then went home in the 1930s. Um, um, I actually met the very last Chetia banker who has a money lending license in Penang. Um, uh, so they are now a very rare breed, um, but they're, they're all over the colonial um, archive. Um, uh, and thank you for the tip about the Indian Heritage Centre. I went to Little India yesterday, but I didn't come across it, so I shall obviously have to go again. Um, so if I could uh, just have a quick follow-up question. Mm. I'm just 
to, to put on my um, economist turban, so to speak. Um, the 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 the, the Sundar is the equivalent of modern HR firms. I mean, this is a very reductionist analogy. Modern human resource firms, placing labor and so on and so forth. The people who migrated, you said, had agency. Well, I'm um, looking for it, and I would claim they have it, yes. Okay. Yeah. And on the other side, the folks who were demanding labor, the plantation owners, after a point of time, despised them. They were uh, intermediary, they could done away, they were chipping into their, eating away into their profits. Likewise, for the workers, um, so they're taking away part of their earnings, and uh, if they had agency, they could probably you know, negotiate bilaterally. So the question is, what is it that allowed them to sustain and flourish? Uh, because they took plants? far more from the planters than they did from the workers, simply. They more often than not secured the workers better wages and conditions. Um, but after a while, can't they, isn't there, a, I mean, my economics logic suggests, you tell them that's only okay, redundant now, I can deal, the workers band together and they can deal directly with the plantation owners. When they're all working together in the one industry, collective bargaining is always more effective. And so that is what they, uh, that's what is the, what they adopted. Um, um, this is generally the practice. And, and Tamil workers became very troublesome uh, to the plantation owners by the 1920s. Um, um, to go back to the uh, story about governance by stealth, um, uh, um, it's important. It, it, it cannot be exaggerated the extent to which uh, the colonial administration of the 19th and early 20th century was really run on a shoestring. It was a really, really thin administration, and um, one of the conventional practices of that era was to to, to manage by essentializing. Mm. Um, if your information was inadequate, you had to find some sort of basis for decision making. So, um, um, social, very broad social categorization, the use of racial categorization as well, was a very, very common uh, part of colonial practice. And it had a very kind of strangely, you know, self fulfilling role. I mean, if you decided that, you know, um, that all, um, I don't know, all, all, um, uh, Bengalis were, were um, troublesome, and you weren't going to employ any in the administration. Um, that arbitrary decision imposed, uh, it told a lesson to everyone else that actually if you didn't turn the line, the same may, fate might befall you as the Bengalis. Yes. So everyone else would become much, much more obedient and hardworking. Mm -hmm. So to the colonial officials, this, this form of decision making actually was was self-fulfilling it did actually seem to work don't employ the Bengalis and somehow miraculously uh, the minister everyone becomes much much more hard-working you decide that it's the, it's the it is the Patans who are the troublemakers in the army well round up a few Patan ringleaders and sh execute them and sure enough all of your regiments become very passive and obedient. It's not because you've actually really found the ringleaders. It's because you've exercised arbitrary power in a way that is intimidating uh, to the to your workforce. Um, um, it was a very, very, it was a very kind of rough and ready way of facilitating decision making in an environment where they really desperately lacked information and knowledge about what they were doing. Um, but. Um, because it was uh, a demonstrative exercise in arbitrary power, it would nonetheless often be effective. Yeah, I don't know if that's the okay. answer you wanted to hear, but that's my, my uh, view on why, why it worked. I, I, I'll have to look up at Martin Hobson Jobson. Yes. Anyway, I, I, what, did actually, Brahm, what did Brahmins do? Uh, yeah, what, we, what did Brahmins do as endangered migrants? Well, that's the funny thing because if you if you uh, uh, you know read the most all the um, uh, right Totoram Shinde um, and other kind of accounts of, of uh, critical accounts of migration in the at the turn of the century, um, uh, they are written by Brahmins whose experiences obviously were not what they expected. You know, they were not accustomed to manual labor. They had a very, very hard time when they went to the plantations and often came back you know, um, uh, bitterly regretting uh, their decision to migrate. Um, and Brahmins were an, in the forefront of the campaign against 
indentured migration. Um, but it's very important to notice that when uh, my indentured migration was finally suspended um, in 1917, uh, there were petitions from uh, Trinidad and from Bagana begging that it be renewed because indentured migration offered a free passage to distant destinations. You only had to work for five years, sometimes, actually I think by then it was only three years, and you would serve out your contract and you'd be free to do what you wanted. So a lot of people who didn't really want to work on plantations and had no experience indeed of agricultural labor would pretend they were agricultural laborers or had some uh, relevant knowledge, would sign on just simply to get a free ticket, uh, hoping that they would then make a bit of money and find other opportunities at the end of their contract. Um, and clearly many Brahmins did so, although they then, as I said, wrote rather critically about their experiences, which were for them sometimes traumatic. Um, okay, I'm afraid um, I'm going to have to bring the conversation uh, to a close, but you can engage uh, Professor Bates over a cup of tea. A um, couple of words before I close. Um, we uh, have um, every second year a major event called the South Asia Diaspora Convention. And more and more, um, it is expected that the Diaspora Convention should have an academic dimension to it. So in the last Diaspora Convention, we had added some panels on uh, South Asian Diaspora and transnational citizenship. I think uh, I'll take away from here the idea that for the next Diaspora Convention, perhaps we could add migration as an academic panel. So migration and uh, South Asian diaspora, if it works out, then we'll have a chance to engage you all over again. I would again. love to come again, yeah, very much enjoy it. And uh, do take up uh, Deepinder's idea, a suggestion, I will. going to the yeah. India Heritage Center. Yeah. I've been there, and you have lots of Chetia yeah. uh, data. I don't know if they have their own archives, but uh, surely they'll guide you in the right direction. I've, yeah. I've found quite a lot of information on Chetias in the petitions I've been looking at in the Kuala Lumpur archives. Um, yeah. They're very, very interesting yeah. characters, some of them. Well, um, we also have a house rule that we never allow our uh, speakers to go away empty-handed, so I have to give you a gift. And the gift we have chosen is a book on Indian Muslims uh, put together by a colleague of mine who is now working on trust, Professor Riaz Hassan, um, who is not able to join us today. Uh, but the book is from now on yours, and uh, don't think of Brahmins and Badmarshes when you read about Indian Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, have a cup of tea.